Welcome to Business Amplified with host Kevin A. Dunlap. This podcast is for small business owners aiming to amplify their enterprises. Explore strategies to play a bigger game by becoming an author, public speaker, podcast host, or expanding your brand in other ways. Elevate your business on Business Amplified. Well, hello, everybody. This is Kevin Dunlap with Business Amplified, and welcome back to another exciting episode that we have in store for you today. So today we have a gentleman. Uh, we were doing a little bit of a pre-interview. Come to find out he lives in both Indiana as well as in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm looking forward to having this call. Uh, so, uh, also, so I want to welcome to the show our newest guest, Barry. Barry, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Kevin. I love your energy and I love how you think so entrepreneurially. I just think it's amazing. Well, well, thank you. Yes, we, we, we've actually been having like a 20 to 25 minute uh, pre-interview uh, conversation, and I'm so excited to uh, actually be starting to share some of this stuff. And some of the stuff that I shared with Barry is because at the time of this recording, he was talking about uh, launching a podcast, and I just showed him some ways that he could possibly cut the, cut that learning curve down uh, a, a, a large amount by just you know, following some simple uh, rules and guidelines. But anyway, so uh, Barry, let's, enough about me. Let's talk about you. Tell us, uh, who are you? What is that you do and why is it that you do what you do? Well, I'm out of the Fort Wayne, Indiana area, but I also live in the Phoenix, Scottsdale area as well. Originally, I, when I was a young boy, I wanted to be in rock music. I wanted to be, I wouldn't say a rock star, but I definitely wanted to be in a rock band because I wrote songs, I recorded songs. I loved it. I loved it. And as I got older, you know, into my teens and early 20s, I worked very hard at that and ended up having some songs, you know, on American Bandstand and I had a video on MTV, things like that. It was great. And as I like to say, Kevin, my music sold well under one million copies. So at, we tried really hard. We did not make money. I still get uh, to this day, I still get royalty checks every three months. And sometimes they're as much as $11. Sometimes, you know, it's a couple of bucks. And, and I'll walk around and show family members my checks and say, this is why I no longer am a full-time musician. What happened then was I really started to fall in love with business. And I wanted to run a business of my own. I started in a jingle company, you know, the irritating little musical ditties. And I graduated into running my own marketing company because one of my clients that I was doing some audio work for, you know, recording things for them, turned to me and asked me to take over all of their marketing. And that was North American Band Lines. I was not a very brilliant uh, entrepreneur at that time, Kevin. So I said, no, that's not what I do. And they said, well, Barry, we really want you to think about it. And I said, I'll give you the names of a bunch of agencies who can go do that, but thank you. This went on and on and on until one day, a year later, the client called me again. He said, Barry, I want to talk to you about outsourcing all of our marketing to you and you taking over our marketing department, your company, not, not me working for them, but me independently doing that. And I said, but why do you want me to do that? I've given you other names. I mean, why? And he goes, because we trust you. Mm. And that really hit me. And at that moment, Kevin, I said, sure, let's do it. And he said, great, we'll start on Monday. I hung up the phone and I'm talking right here openly to your wide audience of entrepreneurial types. I didn't know what I got into there. I went, oh my gosh, what did I just do? But I jumped into it. It worked out. I'm not going to go into many details, but it led to me being named Entrepreneur of the Year. My company then expanded. And then today we are located in Fort Wayne, in Phoenix, as well as Dallas. We do work nationwide and worldwide for great companies, big and small. The larger companies that many of you would have heard of uh, include McAllen Scotch, Audi, uh, automobile. So it's drinking and driving, but we don't do them both at the same time. Uh, but in addition to that, carrier, heating and air conditioning, you know, things like that. Great, great companies. And we're able to differentiate their products for them. And that's what my passion is, 
I love to get in and I look at what somebody is already doing and how they make a product or how they serve their customers. And my team gets very technical and tries to figure out what makes it unique. And there's a little secret in here for all our entrepreneurial friends. We not only learn what makes it unique, we name it. And so there might be three to five unique differentiators we name. And here's where the secret is. We make sure our clients, before they launch it and share it with the world, they celebrate it with their employees first to thank their employees, to give their employees a meaning for what they do, a significance. Now, again, to, to your audience, why would that be important? Of course, it sounds good. Okay, but that gives your employees a purpose. It also means they're more likely to do a better job because after all, this is important. And they're more likely to be retained. They're more likely to ask some of their friends to come on in and apply for a job there. So it works out for everybody. That's why my book is called The Power of Differentiation. And the subtitle tells it all, Kevin, it's win hearts, minds, and market share. That's my story. Yeah, and it's funny that you, that you say that because there's other industries that uh, celebrate things before it's ever even launched. I mean, I mean, I, you may or may not know this, but I've done some stuff in the film industry. And, and then there's this thing that uh, all films, TV shows, <clears throat> whatever you talk about it does, it's called a rap party. So they just finish the last day of shooting and then they go have a rap party with all the mm -hmm. people that were part of that film. <clears throat> now, this is just means that pre-production and production has now ended. Post-production hasn't even started yet. So they haven't started yeah. editing yet. They haven't started marketing the movie yet. I mean, nobody even knows that the movie even exists with the exception of the people who worked on it. And Ooh. the fact that you know, they're saying, hey, let's have a good time to, sh to showcase all the work that we've done is a, is a great way that the, the, the film industry you know, celebrates its employees. The funny thing is, you're not uh, uh, trying to bring it mainstream. That's right. So, yeah, so you know, it's like it's like a you know it, it's a wrap party for this new product. We've now we've, we're done, and let's go party and let's go uh, and celebrate our wins here. You're exactly right. You know, I never thought of it like that. That's a brilliant insight about the wrap party. You're right. That's exactly what that is. It's hey, we've worked hard. We've done so much. Oh my gosh. Let's let our hair down. Let's enjoy each other. Let's celebrate that we achieved this. We got this done. You know, about 30 years ago, I stumbled into this concept that I'm talking about. We call it brand re-engineering. So we don't create a brand. We discover a brand. And some of your audience may say, yeah, but this applies to big companies. It applies to companies of every size. So my company is a small business. Uh, we've had anywhere from 30 to 60 employees, or we've and there have been times where we had 15 employees. But what's interesting is we call it brand re-engineering because we discover what makes a brand unique, not try to create it. Some of your audience has been in business for 10 years, 30 years. We work with a company that's been in business 212 years. They must be doing something right. You know, there's there's got to be something unique they're doing. And that's what we really found. And once we found that, wait a minute, the companies out there are doing something unique, not necessarily superior, but it's different. There's a purpose. Let's discover it. Let's shine a light on it. And what and I'll share this one insight because you kind of inspired it with the rap party. 20, 30 years ago, when I was sharing this concept to CEOs at companies, and I would say, and don't forget, what we need to do is we need to celebrate this with your employees. They would go, this is 20, 30 years ago, everybody, but they would go, I don't care. They're already making their five bucks an hour. Forget them. I'm paying them. I don't need them to celebrate. I don't need to have a work stoppage to do that. Well, everybody, that has all changed. Today, with how difficult it is to retain employees and to inspire them, when I say the exact same words to customers, whether they're large or small companies, and I go, you know, we'll find what makes your product or brand unique, and we will help you name it. 
and promote it, but first you celebrate it with your employees, they literally have a tear in their eyes and they go, we really need that. That's so important here. We need people to know that what they're doing is valued. So it's an inspiring time for me to be able to share that with these other companies. And I'm glad you bring that to, to the attention because I mean, I've been essentially self-employed since 2004, uh, no, 100%. I was a, a part-time employee as a college math teacher uh, and a bartender back in the early in the early 2000s. But before that, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I did work on some uh, different projects as a computer programmer or what have you. Sure. And the thing is, there there was no celebration uh, of uh, of something like that after our project got done. He was like, "This this is this is what you're getting paid for. Why you know why we're going to do this? So you, sh you should just yeah. be happy with your paycheck." But the right. but the thing is, having the appreciation is huge uh, for morale. It is. It's very huge. And the other thing I found is that the other thing I'll hear from some of my clients is they'll go, oh, well, we already told our employees what we're doing and we told them why this is important. And I say, OK, great. When was that? Oh, a couple of years ago, we had a big, big all all company meeting. And, and I always say to them, look, you need to have your company meeting or your rally every chance you can. And it can be one on one. It could be coming up to Kevin and say, hey, Kevin, I want to let you know what you did yesterday is great. Remember, this is what we provide the customers. This is why what you did makes a big difference in our customers' lives. Thank you. That's so huge. It's really great that you did that. Every day is a chance to spread that meaning meaningful message and impactful lesson to our employees as to why we're here and the role they play. Right, and and I really am happy to hear that you that you are starting to do something like that, trying to inspire the people. Because I I think that yeah, if the people are if the employees do feel appreciated, because a lot of them a lot of people don't. I would say probably a good 80 percent of the people out there who are working a job are most of them are probably not happy with their work. They're not happy with their the company they work with. They're just doing it because they have to. And but the thing is, if they can, if a company can show that appreciation, then that means that employee will be happier in the workplace and be more productive. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, so tell me, because you've been doing the marketing for a while. Uh, one of the uh, questions I usually like, like to ask my guests is like, as you were growing your business, uh, business, uh, what's like maybe one of your biggest challenges? And then how did you overcome that challenge? I had a lot of challenges growing the business. Number one, I never got a loan. So I had to do it with the money that was coming in. So I'm a bootstrapper started from scratch, had nobody working for me. And basically I ran my company like I ran a rock band. So it was like, hey, you wanna come over? You wanna help me on this? Hey, great, you know. And what happened originally, my biggest challenge was I was saying yes to almost everything. Cause I, I woke up every day, I had no momentum, had no business. Because I started during a recession, which when you look back on it, you go, oh, my gosh, you started like at the worst time. But I, I started, there was no business going on. And I literally every day had zero on my speedometer. And I had to get it as high up as I could by the end of the day just to get some momentum. As I started to get more mature and we were gaining customers, here's what I had to struggle with. And this is what I did. I found that I had a group of customers that were really great and I loved them. And I, I just wish I had more of them. But I also had a group of customers that were very difficult. I wouldn't say they were mean or nasty. They just were difficult and it was hard to make money. And I never felt like they were pleased and it was just difficult. One day I was so frustrated. I called in my six or seven people and I just said, hey, can you help me here? Let's do a jam session. And that's one thing my company does. We actually have a proprietary jam session where we get together and we don't just throw ideas around. We have a process. 
And I said, let's look at this. Why is this group of customers a joy? And why is this other group of customers not? What is the difference? So in a nutshell, what we found was we had a certain niche or niche, depending on you, how you pronounce it, that we really served well. And those customers just happened to be the friendliest and most satisfied. And they also happened to be the ones growing. And they also happened to be the ones that were profitable. We also then had a fairly large group of customers that were the opposite. We were not growing. It was a fight. We were not making money. They would argue over everything. And they were kind of tough to deal with. We identified that they didn't fit that niche, that niche that we had and made that, made that tough decision. And I'll share this with your audience because it's scary when you're a small business. We made the decision that we would have to divest we'd have to leave that group. Now, not fire them on the spot, but we would have to transition our way out from working with that group of customers. And we did. I was very afraid. You mentioned challenge. I was very afraid that, oh my gosh, you know, that's one third of our business. We're gonna die. We're gonna fall apart. We made the decision. We focus on the clients that actually fit our business. And this sounds like a fairy tale, but it's not. We never had even a hiccup in our business. It We grew from that point. We didn't even have a month where we, we went, oh my gosh, we're way down because we cut off a third of these clients. So what happened in, the, in that very short period of time, Kevin, was we identified where we really made a difference and with what type of client we then decided to focus solely on them. The wonderful side benefit was it improved our morale because we had happier employees because now they're working with customers who actually appreciate them. That was my biggest challenge. Well, and I know I talk about this a lot in many of my courses and I'm sure Barry has heard this before as well. Um, people talk about you know, who's your ideal client. Uh, some people say, who's your avatar? I call who's your specific audience because I want you to be specific. The thing is, when Barry started out, his his uh, his his ideal client was not his was not the people he was working with. He was just, just hey, anybody that wants to uh, use our services well, could come in, even if they were not that that best fit. And the thing is, by turning away those clients that did not fit made you more profitable, even though from a scarcity concept that, you know, turning away clients means you're going to lose business when in our reality, you're going to just attract more of the right people that you want to work with. And thereby you're going to be, in my opinion, more profitable that way. You're it's you're right on target. The way I look at it for your audience, this might be entertaining is that you do not want fog a mirror clients or customers, just because they can fog a mirror does not mean they are the ideal customer. And the more particular I found I was, the more likely I got more business. At one point I decided in my, in my, my region, I only wanted to add two or three new clients that year. And I thought, well, that sounds small, but I thought, you know, I'm going to do an experiment. So we had a few prospective clients come in during a one week period of time to talk to us and we were sharing what we do. And I said, oh, by the way, we're only going to add two or three new clients this year because we, we don't want to rob our focus from our current customer base. We want to take care of them. And the first prospect I said that to, which was a, a very fine company and a great leader, he leaned forward across the table. He said, okay, I want to be one of those two or three right now. And I thought, wow. So by thinking small, you could say, it helped me grow bigger because I showed that, wait a minute, I am discerning. I am not just going to pick up any business for any amount from anybody. I want this to be a good fit. And I think that's, it's scary to do, especially when you're a smaller company, because, you know, one customer, oh my gosh, what are we going to do if we don't have them? But the truth is, you have to look at where you are strongest and then stand tall 
and say, this is how we do it. This is how we work with you. More or less, I would have to say the pickier I have been, the more successful I've been. The thing is, that by doing something like that, and I'm assuming you built rapport and, and had uh, respect uh, from that person, uh, that, that that's kind of a, a given in this regard. However, you're also putting a, a what is known as a limiter on your um, uh, on the table. And when you put a limiter on on anything, I mean, it could be, hey, I'm, I'm standing on stage. I'm only have to, I only brought twenty books with me. The first twenty that to, uh, to buy the books, well, you know, we'll get the rest of you. will have to get it by mail. It'll be, be a week from now. Mm -hmm. but, so, or saying, hey, we're all going to do this for the next thirty minutes by by putting that limiter in effect. And you have something that somebody wants to purchase, then yes, that that will that will make the difference of somebody who they want to work with you or not, and then. And if the people are not, then you're, you're turning those people away that you're going to basically turn away anyway. Exactly right. So, so I mean, that, that's a, tr a tried and true uh, concept. Uh, but Barry here, he actually uh, uh, put it to the, to the test without, without actually saying that's what he was doing. <laughs> and, and the second thing is, like, like he also said, um, when you are saying, "Hey, I want to," I only want to take on two or three more clients. I mean, he's, he's also telling the truth there because he didn't want to uh, spread himself so thin that he's going to that is uh, that his effectiveness would start to become uh, eroded. You know, and my biggest regrets when I was growing my business originally, because I've been in business for forty years, is I'd say my biggest regret is that I spread myself too thin from time to time. And not so much that, gee, that burned me out or gee, I felt tired. Cause I don't, the way my personality is, I don't give myself much room for that. It's like, come on, you can figure that out. But it was because the quality of what I was providing was not as high because I wasn't really attending to it like I should. So I've looked at things where even to a level of irritation with my team, and I've got a great team, I've never had a better group of people in my life working with me. I don't even look at it as working for me. But even to the point of irritation, one of the differentiators with my company is we are very hands-on with our clients. And if a client says, hey, will you help me? Will you? We, we really need this. We really need help here. Nobody goes, well, I'll see where you fit in the schedule and I'll get back with you next week. Our answer is, hey, look, we'll help you. What do you need? I'll see what we can do. We'll get back with you within you know, minutes or an hour, whenever. And we're going to come up with some ideas. We're going to help you. And that's because nobody, or none of our clients at least, Kevin, none of our clients want some company to be arrogant or uppity or uh, distant when they reach out, because to our clients, this whatever they're dealing with is personal to them. Well, it better be personal to us. So that's mm -hmm. that's a big challenge we we focus on every day. My company's differentiator is we are not the heroes. We work for the heroes, or we want our clients to look like the heroes, and we want their brands or companies to look like the heroes. So we're behind the heroes. We're the people behind the great people. And what that means is if it's 730 at night, we'll answer the phone. If it means it's 730 at night and there's a text or an email, we don't go, well, you know, we don't start to work till eight o'clock tomorrow morning, Eastern Standard Time. We go, what do you need? That's one of our differentiators. Now, none of our people are obligated to work crazy hours and none of them have to work on the weekends. It's not a bad thing, but it's Part of what you sign up for with my company is it's personal with us. We want to take care of you. We're not saying we'll be perfect, but man, we want to be there for you. And we're going to do our best to make sure you're taken care of. You know, and I'm glad to hear that you are that person that goes the, the extra mile. There's a lot of people uh, in any industry that they don't do that. Uh, for example, I know for myself, um, when I was running my real estate business back in 2004 to 2020 uh, in Las Vegas, 
uh, I adopted a philosophy and then uh, I was in, like I said, I was in real estate. Uh, I adopted a philosophy that uh, when I talked to other realtors at, at that time, they did, they did not adopt. And I would say, if somebody, like say for an example, if somebody get, uh, leaves you a message uh, uh, on your voice knowing, let's say you are with another client at the time that they called, so mm -hmm. how quickly do you call them back? And the standard realtor said within 24 hours it is acceptable. That's way unacceptable. One hour is unacceptable. I mean, you have to, you have to be, because you never know what that client needs. And their needs are, like, like what Barry just said, are very personal to them. This is something that's worrying them right now. So who are you putting first, yourself or your client? Right. And, you know, you can always answer with a text and say, I am with a client. I will be free at 3, a, uh, 3 p.m. today. Is that good? Well, that customer thinks, OK, he or she got my message. They care. Yes, I can wait. And it also means that customer is not going to go elsewhere for help because you went dark on them. Uh, exactly, because because I, so I those and again I'm just going to relate relate this to real estate because that was my experience at that time, is a lot of realtors were complaining about you know, not getting all that many customers. And since if they left you a message and you don't call back, they're going to call the next realtor who will call them back right. who who will answer their phone. And that's yeah. and to me this is true in just about any industry. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, especially if they're a new club, a new potential client. Is right. there's other people that are going to be doing a similar service that you're that you're doing, and if you're not responsive enough, that they, they will get the feeling that they're not important enough. That's exactly right. You know, it's almost any business anywhere. If we do not respond, and we don't have to turn this into a drama, you mentioned being in the movie industry, it doesn't have to be a dramatic thing. It doesn't have to be, okay, well, I'll have to go tell the current client I'm on the phone with that they're not important. And that, no, no. Let the person who is reaching out know that it's that it's critical to you also, and that you will get back at this point, not next day, not when I have time, not ghosting them but actually giving them that, that slight 10, 15 seconds of a text. And if you say, well, that's interrupting the client you're with, you can ask for permission, say, hey, Kevin, could you hold on just a moment? I'm gonna text somebody who really is in need. I'm not gonna let it interrupt where we're at in this discussion, but I wanna make sure that I, that I let them know that I'm gonna take care of them after you and I are finished with our discussion. Well, Kevin then gets the message that, okay, Barry is trying to take care of somebody else, but he's showing respect to me. He's not going to kind of give me the bums rush and get me off the phone for some reason. So there's ways you can do it. I think it's in this world of AI and technology, if you're not more personal and more one-on-one -on -one with your clients and customers today than you were five years ago, you're in big trouble. Yeah, and 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 the time frames that I was talking about uh, earlier examples was uh, when texting was still kind of new, but yeah, now you can have auto responders, not auto responders, but uh, uh, pre generated uh, uh, text messages that you can send to somebody regardless of who they are. Because like, hey, if somebody calls me while I'm in a meeting, just send that. Hey, I'm sorry, I can't talk right now. I'll give you a call back in in a few minutes uh, when I'm done with, with with the client that I'm giving my hundred percent attention to right now. And, and off I go. That's a great tip. Well, and it, so it makes both people feel appreciated. Not only does it give the response to the person calling, but they're also saying, hey, you're dedicated to a person right now you, you, and you want to be 100% focused on them as well. I, and I hope they're going to be the same way with me. Mm. Great idea. <laughs> so now, uh, uh, Barry, uh, if somebody wanted to, uh, to to work with you or find out more about what you do, what's the best way for them to find you? Do you have a website, a landing page, a calendar link? And do, how, can get a, how can they get a hold of you? Sure. Uh, the easiest way, and I would urge anybody that has questions, even if it's not a possible business relationship, which is fine with me, to reach out to my website, which is www.labove, which is my last name, five letters, L A. B O V dot com. So it's labove.com. Take a look, look at some of the clients we have, look at some of the beautiful photography and some of the interesting videos that are on there. And then you can find me in there. We'll talk, we talk about our team. 
click on there, send me a message. It could be, hey, I want to know about your book when it comes out. Let me know. I may end up wanting to read it. It could be, hey, I have a question about being an entrepreneur. I have a question about such and such. Hey, I know somebody that may be interested. Whatever it is, I get dozens and dozens of inquiries. I'd say 90% are primarily social. We're helping each other. We're saying, hey, you ought to check out this or whatever. So feel free to do it. Labove.com. Okay, I guess that's at uh, www.labove.com. Uh, so, so Barry, I do, I do want to thank you for, uh, for being on here. And before we go, I do also want to say that for anybody out there who's out there listening to this show, and you feel like you might be a good guest uh, for our show, or if you feel like you know somebody who could be a good guest for our show, just have them go in and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. And that's going to be at our podcast website, which is at www.businessamplified.net forward slash pre-interview. Again, that's businessamplified.net forward slash pre-interview, no dash, just uh, the pre-interview spelled out all letters. Uh, and going back to Barry, so Barry, I definitely want to say thank you for being on the show. You've given us uh, some great insights, especially about those, hey, celebrate the wins with your people even before it's going to be launched. Just celebrate those things. Look at it, the way I looked at it as when I, whenever a film stops or stops filming, it's called a rap. Say, hey, that's a rap. That's why they call it a rap party that's rap w-r-a-p not rap as in reggae so that's gonna be a rap party they're it's celebrating the fact that they just finished this project so doing the same thing in your business is one great way for you to uh appreciate your customers uh, or clients or excuse me your your employees or co-workers and also just so that they can you know they, you know they'll say I, i'm just gonna be motivated the next time we got the next project i completed so, Barry, are, is there any last words that you have with uh, uh, with our uh, viewers and our listeners before we go? One thing I would say is take a look at what you offer your clients, whether it's a service or a product. Step back, look at it with some fresh eyes. Maybe have some friends or family members look at what you're doing. Find two or three unique things you're doing. Things that are special things that your customers really appreciate and start to make sure that you are promoting them that you are explaining why you're doing that to your customers and as kevin said celebrate those differences first with your employees that way you have an entirely aligned organization that's focused on the very strongest things they do for customers Again, I, I'm going to relate this again to the film industry because that's where I've got some experience in. He said, pick uh, two or three things and highlight those things when you're doing your marketing and advertising. It's going to be very similar to the film industry when they do this, this thing called a a a, a, a a preview. They pull out two or three parts of the of the movie. Said, this is how we're going to market this movie. We're not going to show you that whole 90 minute movie. We're going to show you a 30 second snicker. So the same thing is being held in your business as well. Looking is looking as this is a preview for what are you, for what you're going to get by um, by investing or buying this product or service. And Barry is just nodding his head yes for those who are in the audio world. Uh, so again, uh, Barry, uh, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you so much, and I love the work you're doing. And your energy and insights are fantastic. Uh, I learned a lot today, so I'm going to start doing rap parties. And my book is coming out shortly, and we're going to have a rap party as soon as we uh, send it to the publisher before it is printed. We'll say in your case, it's going to be like a pre-launch party. Yes, that's a good way to put it too. <laughs> okay, so everybody, I would say thank you for being on the show today. As, uh, please stay tuned for our, our, some of our other great and amazing guests. And guys, until next time, be amazing. Thanks for tuning in to another empowering episode of Business Amplified with Kevin A. Dunlap. If you found value in today's insights, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the podcast. Keep amplifying your business. And remember, your success journey is our inspiration. Until next time on Business Amplified, go out there and make your business thrive. Thank you.